acknowledging the Bedigal people who are the traditional owners of this land and in a different timeline they would have been working in this area and living in harmony with the land and we uh, recognise and respect their elders past and present. My name's Colfi and I'm going to be the MC of this event which is a nice way of saying I'm going to be hurting you, you're the cats. Um, raise your hand if you've been to the coaching conference before. Cool, and now raise your hand if this is your first time. <coughs> Excellent, good choice. Well done. This is, I believe, the third iteration of this conference and the second in this particular venue. And last year it was a phenomenal event and an amazing experience. And I noticed a lot of things that happened in the Frisbee community over the course of the next 12 months that would directly, clearly influence our conversations that happened in this room. So this is a really exciting moment that we've got. I love that so many people are still arriving. <laughs> I love that so many people have committed so much time and money to getting here because we care so much about Frisbee. This is an amazing community and this room is like a concentrated example of the community that we have. Um, it's amazing to have everyone here together. I reckon there are two ways to learn. How many ways are there to learn? Two. two. There's the old way and the? New way. Right, and the old way, someone could stand at the front and and everybody in the audience would sit there and... Talk. <laughs> Remarkably accurate. <laughs> and the old way is pretty... boring, and we all fall asleep. So let's do the new way. The new way is where this isn't presentations from the front, it's conversations in the room, okay? And we're gonna work as much as possible not to just share information here, but to have conversations and make decisions and make progress, okay? And I reckon there's a few different things that we can do as a collective to help make sure that that's what we're doing and that we don't just kind of sit there, arms crossed in the audience, listening for a while, slowly drifting off to sleep and then later checking Twitter and then going home on Sunday night and wondering what we did here. We really want to do stuff and there's a few things I think that we can do in order to make that happen. Number one, the environment we're in, for some of them, this room in particular, is kind of conducive to the old way because there's a person up the front and all the seats facing this way. So when we're in this room, make sure you're sitting in a group, okay? So that any time if the person up the front says, let's have a conversation, you can turn around and you're having a conversation. Is that okay? Is anyone not presently sitting where they can have a conversation? If so, quickly move. I think you're right, Katie. I think you're good. <laughs> Thanks for getting in the spirit, Dan. Much appreciated. Thing number two, have a notebook or a computer or something out. You all overrate your memory. You all go, oh, that's a great point. I can't wait to talk about that later. And then in 15 seconds, gone. Capture the stuff that's good and let's make sure that we can use it again later. So does everyone have a notebook or a computer ready to go? Yes? If not, rummage now, make lots of noise, it's okay, get that out. It's going to start now, we're about to get into it and we want to be taking notes. My suggestion is that while what happens in the room is awesome, actually a lot of the time what happens in the corridor and at the lunch break is when the real magic happens with amazing conversations with someone we haven't met before who has this great new perspective. And everybody is now walking around with a digital recorder in their pocket and so my suggestion is anytime you start having a conversation with someone in a totally non-creepy way, just get your phone out and press record and just have your conversation. Now, if it's a boring conversation, at the end, slap them and just delete that, you don't need it. But if it's a really good conversation, I promise you, you will thank yourself later. You'll be on the plane on the way home and you'll be saying, Johnny Warren White said that, oh, it was amazing, what was it? And then you flip back through your phone and you've got his genius captured there ready to use again. Okay, so can we all, the pressure's on you now, Johnny. <laughs> Gotta make it happen. Right, and the last thing that I would like you to do here is make decisions. So humans have this thing that we love to do where we like to keep our options open, and that's another way of saying do nothing. Okay, and what we want to do at this conference is have, look at all the like whole amazing spectrum, the whole universe of possibility that exists, but then actually pick something and go and do it. So I'd suggest that every time you see something happening, you're engaged in a conversation that's inspiring you. Don't just get inspired. Choose to do something and make a note of it. 
I want to start now. So with your notebook or your computer or whatever it is that you've got, just have a chat to the person next to you about what you would love to get out of this weekend. If there was one thing that you could set your intention around that you'd love to get out of this weekend, what would it be? Have a chat to the people next to you. You've got like 45 seconds to go.
Thank you, Cole. Anyone following Cole has a huge job to live up to. He's an amazing speaker. Uh, and he's awesome at the role of MC, so thank you, Cole, for stepping in. Um, so on behalf of the APDA board, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2018 National Conference. Thank you very much for giving up your time. I'm reiterating what Cole said, but it's really important that without you guys, this conference means nothing. We can do all the work we can do, but without you here to engage and work with us, it's just meaningless. So thank you very much for giving us your time. We've got people from New Zealand, India, and all across Australia, so that is fantastic. Um, over the next two days, we've got a very extensive agenda, so thank you for the stream leaders for that. We've got amazing topics and awesome presenters. They're leaders in their fields, every single one of them. So it is just a wonderful conference. Um, uh, so what, one of the things that Cole did touch upon, but I'd like to reiterate as well, there's a lot of knowledge here and a lot of good discussions will happen, but take the time to get to know the other people in the conference. When you're out having a coffee, or lunchtime, or dinner, or the drinks, make um, network. Get to know the people in the other states. Because when you go back home, and you need help in a different area, there's people are all around Australia. Ultimate is wonderful in the fact that we are such, we, we all love to help each other, and it's all for the right reason. So make these contacts, and reach out and use them when you go back. Establish an a worldwide network effectively with our international guests as well. Um, come meet the board at 3.30. I know we're competing against two really good streams, so you guys will probably choose them over us, but we would love to meet you. Come and uh, whinge about what's going wrong or what we're not doing right, or uh, just tell us what's going right in your area. But you know, come to meet us. We'd love to actually talk to you and get to know you guys. My job, I know I want to try to reach out to every single state. I've started that job. I haven't been able to reach every state yet, but I'm hoping that I can reinforce that at this conference. So I want to be open. I want to be actually um, reachable to you guys. So anytime, drop me an email or ring me. You'll be able to get my contact details off the web. Um, so over the last four months, the board's been very busy. We've done a lot of things. We've done high performance, we've done um, meetings and getting to know each other and all that. But some of the important things that we've started on is the journey of transforming the AFDA. We, this was triggered by the fact that our constitution was so far out of date, we're probably potentially illegal. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of a good trigger point to start and look at a whole organisation structure. And so I've got two awful, uh, awesome speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Awesomely awesome said, speakers to follow, <laughs> <laughs> to follow up on this. But we're going through, we're looking at how Australian Ultimate has progressed so far in the elite. We are in the top four countries consistently of the world. Yet our governance and our infrastructure is antiquated as like the old traditional sports. We have the chance to be something special because we don't have to wear those old mantles. We're agile, that's a wanky word I know, but it's still <laughs> effective. But we are, you know, we have a lot of great people around Australia. We have the chance to transform ourselves into something special. And these two people are going to take you onto the start of that journey of where we're going. And to introduce them, uh, we've got Ellen Taylor, who is going. Uh, Emma. Emma! Emma Taylor. I'm, uh, sorry, I suck at names. <laughs> Just kidding, sorry, Emma. That's okay, I was going to call it Ellen Briggs too, so don't worry. <laughs> sorry, Briggs. <Rick. laughs> but Emma is an expert in sports governance. She started playing in the year 2000, but she's been on cuter boards. She's worked in the sports industry for over 25 years in anti doping and governance. She currently works with people like judo, karate volleyball and gymnastics, but she was a central portion or person for netball, swimming and little athletics and the governance reform for them as well. So she brings an immense knowledge of how the infrastructure works. She's on top of what's new, what's going on with the Australian Sports Commission and all that sort of stuff. So we've got a, a fantastic opportunity with Emma to uh, guide us along the way and she's got a fantastic co-leader with Sandra, who has, Sandra Poon, a lot of you guys probably know Sandra, 
She's played and administered in Ultimate for over 25 years as well. Started out in Victoria, moved, uh, she got stolen up to Queensland, um, but she established herself up there just as well. She's tournament directed multiple national events, at least two, ran an untold amount of um, halibuts, local of, uh, tournaments as well. But more importantly, she's actually been senior management consultant for very large organisations. Some of the big ones, Suncorp and Teese, a lot of the other major banks as well. She's been through process improvement within those organisations. She's led the large scale transformations for those organisations, as well as corporate governance. These two ladies are just fantastic and are, we are just, it's a great opportunity that we've got to utilise their expertise now to move on into the future. So Emma will take over, followed by Sandra. Emma. Zero pressure after Cole's expectations and Simon's been up, so um, <laughs> whew, bear with me. Um, I'm hoping though my passion and enthusiasm about governance is going to transcend over to you today and you're going to be able to walk away from here with the sharing some of my enthusiasm. Um, so Sandra and I are going to run through this first session. I'm going to cover off talking about the area of governance and some governance reform that we're looking at which segues really well into what Sandra's looking at with our strategic plan because we're in a great position right now that we can work on these um, together but also in parallel for what they're going to be able to achieve for us. So and I'm going to try and do as Cole said and engage you in this process. Governance. So exciting, such a great word. <laughs> 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 Three cheers for governance. Um, but it is a term and it gets thrown around a lot. I would love to know whether you are a player, a coach, an administrator, a spectator. What, how is governance relevant to you? You can either yell it out or you can have a chat. You can tell me, how is governance relevant to you? Your understanding of what governance is, whatever that may be. Determines your rights and responsibilities as a player or a community. Yep. Deals with a bunch of the admin stuff, like, oh, yep. I want to put together a tournament or what I do. Admin, yep. And that became the legal entity of the AFDA. And 
for whatever reason, and thought, well, I actually know the reason, but that constitution has stayed the same since 1989. The world has changed since then. So from there, state groups started forming. So New South, a group of people in New South Wales got together and focused on what was happening in New South Wales. From there, the states became their own legal entities and they all got incorporated. I worked with um, CUDA on their incorporation back in 2000 because we saw the opportunities were happening at a local level and wanted to progress. Since everyone became legal entities, policy got introduced because all of a sudden, as we were growing and things were changing, we were making decisions. But we needed some structure around that. And then government funding started coming into the states primarily. So, and I know lots of states receive funding for various things. So all this time we're growing, administratively we're growing. And then we started employing staff at a national level and at state level. And in many instances being managed by volunteers. All the while, our on-field success has been phenomenal. And I just want to share with you um, a meeting we had with the Sports Commission a couple of months ago. So they had lots of changes go on. We went, right, let's go in and meet with them because met with them several times. They always tell us we're doing a great job, but we're getting nowhere with getting inroads into getting support out of the Australian Sports Commission. And Dan and I went to Melbourne and, well, Dan's in Melbourne, and we met with the Commission and we outlined, we went in and we showed them the participation plan. We told them about how we're performing internationally. And this, the guy who's a new director in there, he's come from cricket and all these other sporting sports. And he got really excited. Like, he had the, the notion of self-refereeing spirit of the game just really resonated with him and he was so excited. And I said to Dan before, we can't wait till I ask about our governance. Sure enough, the excitement died down when he went, so tell me about your governance. And from a sports commission perspective, until we can perform off the field the same way we're performing on the field, they're not going to talk to us. Because they're government. And it's a risk them giving us money. Would you give someone $200,000 and not have any checks and balances in place? Their checks and balances are our governance. So, from a, so while, while Ultimate has evolved in Australia, the sport industry, so the bigger picture, has also evolved a lot. So it really kicked off in 1983 when the Sports Commission and the AIS were formed. And they were formed because Australia did so badly at the 1982 Olympic Games. So if you didn't know that, a bit of trivia. Um, that, yeah, we performed so badly, the Australian government was so embarrassed, they said we have to do something to improve our performance at an Olympic level. And that is why the Sports Commission came into play. Since then, they've gotten lots of money, given out lots of money, that's all gone up, supporting athletes. State governments have got sport and recreation departments that have grown and shrunk and grown again and shrunk again. Um, lots of regulations and legislation have come into play. And our society has changed. So I'd just like you to take one minute to have a chat what can you identify in society that has changed, that has affected us as a sport? What are some of the things that are affecting us as a sport that relate to our society and our culture has changed? <laughs>
Yeah. So some of the things that sport has reacted to, or the sport industry, is risk management. So we talked about risk. We're a much more litigious society. We sue council if we trip on a footpath because we're all texting on our phone and not watching where we're going. <coughs> we're much more accountable. So the accountability, you don't just get something now and there's no no responsibility for it. Everyone is more accountable for everything. Inclusion. So we have a much more diverse population now that we have become much more inclusive of. Lifestyle. About being more active. We've all gotten fat in the society that's gotten fatter. They want us to move. The Sports Commission now wants to focus on getting active for 30 minutes. And if you've seen the new Sport Australia ad that starts with somebody throwing a frisbee and they don't fund us. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> and child safe environments. You know, this has become a huge concern for sport. I um, over in WA recently, Potters Low Surf Life Saving Club just got fined fifty thousand dollars because they let a volunteer work who had received a negative um, working with children notice. Fifty thousand dollars to a surf life saving club. This is the world we now live in in sport. So where do we want... Oh, I didn't tidy this slide up. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll bring it here. Where, did, where do we want the AFDA... Where's the AFDA looking? We're 2018, so where are we looking to go now? And, and as Simon said, over the last few months, um, the board has worked really positively, really proactively at looking at where do we need to go? Because we acknowledge where we come from but the world has changed. And this piece about maintaining this on-field performance, the next step of thriving in that space is getting the off-field right and getting this administration right. So we need to look at what our industry standards are. We want to be one of the industry leaders in terms of delivering sport in Australia. Leadership, as Simon said. He wants, to, he, he wants you to feel like you can come and approach any member of the AFDA board or the AFDA just to have a chat, to reach out. We, we want to show you that leadership. Our behaviour is part of being more inclusive. We want to walk the talk. There's no point us telling you you should have these industry standards if we don't have them ourselves. Our relationships, like I said, about having that engagement. And we want to be young and innovative. It's, um, as I've worked with a lot of sports who have a lot of history. And we are really fortunate that we don't have a lot of the tradition holding us back that a lot of other sports do. It might feel like we do, but we actually don't compare to a lot of other sports. So we have the opportunity to become a sport entity unlike any other in this country in terms of how we structure ourselves. It's a huge, I'm so excited because it's so boring working with all the others that have these systematic structures and because we did it this way, we have to keep it. So, how are we going to do this? There's this little document put out by the Australian Sports Commission called the Sports Governance Principles. It sounds like riveting reading. What we are going to do though is post this conference, is circulate a paper to you that was written in 2016 that explains to you how the sport industry should be structured or is structured. I guess, from a governance perspective. So that admin, that policy piece, what does that structure actually mean? It's a really good way to understand sport governance in Australia. So we'll circulate that to you. So you just have a bit of a reading spare time, get excited about it. Um, but it's all hinging on these governance principles. These were developed in 2010 by the Sports Commission because they wanted to set a standard for how national sports, therefore filtering down to states, were operating. They wanted sports to be better managed. So they went, right, let's give them a hand. Let's develop some of these. Um, I was actually involved in the development of these when I was working for Queensland Government. Um, and they were, set, they were set up to be the guide. But if we want funding from the Sports Commission, they want to see these in our sport. So I'm just going to run through the six principles. I'm just going to run over them and, um, and explain some of the pieces to you. So. The first principle is board composition, roles and powers. <coughs> so some of the key things in that, that, they expect national sports to be incorporated under the Corporations Act. So that could be a company limited by guarantee or the National Corporations Act. At the moment, we're incorporated under WA legislation, but we operate nationally with an Australian company number. 
the WA legislation is great for state sporting organisations, for local clubs, for other not-for-profits in Western Australia. Because there are differences, because work, I work with the Queensland legislation as well, there are slight differences. They want us working under national legislation. We need to, we need to move on from that. Um, they want the majority of the board, hang on, the majority of the board should be elected by the members. So at the moment, 2% of you voted for the current AFDA board. 2% of ultimate players in Australia who have a right to vote, 2% voted for the current board. 2%. Well, imagine 2% of the population voted for the Prime Minister. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't find them though. That's what we're going on with our revenue generation. We don't find people. Um, but they also want the board to be able to select some other board directors. So, so we have elected directors and appointed directors. Elected directors appointed by the, elected by the membership, voted on by the membership. But appointed directors, a group of people who the board, the elected directors get together and go, well, I'm good in this area and I've got skills in this area. What are we missing? Oh, someone with some financial background would be great. They'd complement our skill set. Let's go find someone. So it's about finding that mix. Oh, the controversial one. The chairman or president is selected, selected by the board. So you don't vote for a president anymore. So a situation where, like you have in America, you vote for the president and you vote for the party. And sometimes they do not meet. Sometimes they're on opposite sides. At the moment, we elect a president. Next slide. Um, but we also elect the rest of the board. The purpose of this is to identify as a group, the board as a group, work out who's going to be the best fit for that particular group. Also helps with succession planning. So a sport I'm working with, I'm about to lose my chairman, who is amazing. Um, we have five, five elected directors, two appointed directors on this board. We are actively going out to fill an appointed director position with the purpose of that person being the chairman because we can. And because for me, well I speak to my chairman every day in the sport, I need someone I can work with who understands what we're doing. So we are actively seeking someone who does not come from our sport in this case too, um, but has the skill set that will complement our sport. And that we all have aligned objectives and purpose. And this is where Sandra will come in later where we talk about, we achieve that through our strategic planning, which again is something we haven't worked with our states on a lot, if at all, really at all, let's be honest. So we will have to do that if we're gonna comply with these principles. Number two, board processes. Do you need to stretch? There's five more to go. <laughs> that the board committees should have a clear terms of reference or charter. So, Sorry, there were a bunch of other principles in with principle one, a lot, a lot of other points, but they were the key ones for you. Um, terms of references for our committees. So in our ideal structure, we will have our board, which is a mix of elected and appointed directors. And then to facilitate the rest of business of ultimate in Australia, we'll have some committees. We'll have high performance. Making assumptions, no, we'll have a high performance committee. We might have a youth participation committee. We might have a or a schools committee. We might have a coaching committee. We will identify what committees are going to help us facilitate our business. When we have our strategic plan, that will help us inform what committees we need. But each committee has their, I call it a bit of a, it's a, bit of a semi constitution, but it's a in terms of reference. Who's on that committee? What's their purpose? How long are they going to be around for? How often do they have to meet? Who reports back to the board? So it gives us that structure that we currently don't have. They don't have decision-making powers. That rests with the board. But it's that committee's role to make recommendations to the board. So that the board can get on. So it's the taking the operations away from the board because your board, the last thing you want is your board getting involved in the operational decisions. Let them approve it. And we currently do it with the selection committee for, um, for coaches and team managers, etc. So at the moment, that committee processes all the applications, the tools, facilitates the application process, they make their determination, the recommendation comes to the board. 
then the board vote on it. But we haven't had to drive the process. That is what we need to move to as a whole organisation. And you can feel free to do it at a state level too. Can I ask a the dumb question? The, no, no dumb question. Okay, great. Right. Uh, I'll ask this my question then. Uh, the, um, uh, so in terms of getting operational matters outside the board, like it totally makes sense for me in, a, in that selection context that you just mentioned. What other sort of things uh, are you talking about when you're talking about getting operational matters out of board control? Organising your budget. Mm -hmm. So have another group. Have your finance audit and risk committee. That's that group of people, it's their job to facilitate the development of the budget, to do the risk management plan that the board, that then gets fed up to the board to approve. It's um, determining your national coaching program. Don't, don't, don't have board members sit around and talk about that. Have the people who are specialists in that area, who have the passion for that particular area, drive that process. So it kind of makes being a board member a little bit easier. But it's about moving the strategy up to keeping the board at a strategic level and moving. And I, I totally appreciate it at a state level. That's really difficult. And even further down at a club level. Like I support two state sporting organisation boards and one of them, my God, we sit there and we talk about who's going to, which referee gets to go to that and how much money they're going to get to go. Like, let the committee do it. Let's get a policy in place so we don't even have to have a discussion. It's, this is the criteria, tick, tick, you've met it. You get the money off you go. So does that help? A lot, thank you. Great. Excellent. Um, governance systems. The board should implement an effective compliance system. We don't currently do this. This is the risk bit. This is, if we want to get $200,000 or more out of the Australian Sports Commission, they need to know that we're a good bet. They need to know that we've got the right systems and processes in place that we are not going to squander taxpayer money. You have to do it at a state level. And a lot of you are doing it at a state level. You have to fill out those quill forms and sign off and spend the money on the right thing. Sports Commission, it's a whole other level because of the level of dollars we're talking about and we're dealing with federal government, which is just a whole other level of horrible red tape. But I, I, I'm very empathetic to bureaucracy because I was a bureaucrat for a long time. Um, audit systems. <coughs> we don't do a lot of auditing. It sounds really boring. I think auditing sounds boring, like other people think governance sounds boring, so I'm empathetic to it. But, you know, we need to review ourselves. We need to get a structure in place. We review our on field performance, we review the performance of our teams. Where are we reviewing our performance off the field? We're not. So, this, these principles, these systems make us do that and it will make us better. No I don't see a negative in this. I see that as a real positive. And we have a nomination committee. I know that sounds really trivial, but I've seen it work really well in a lot of other organisations. That we have a group of people that take on the process. We currently do it with our high performance teams. But what up? So we have a we have a group that get together that go, okay, we need to call these positions, this is the position description, we'll send out the notice, get the applications in, and they make, they assess them, they do interviews, they make the decisions. We need to move that to our board elections. We need to move that to any other kind of appointment we want to make in this board, because it makes it more, trans we make sure that we've got a transparent process. We make sure that we've got objectivity in the process. It also, for me, goes in with re like reward and recognition committees as well. Acknowledging volunteers is probably one of the biggest um, failings of sport in general. Um, if you reward, if you recognise your volunteers, but do it in a really considered way, the way it affects your culture is enormous. But who has the time to do that? Because we're all volunteers doing other things like coaching and organising fields and trying to get access to different programs. Give it as a dedicated job to a group of people. And that's what this is also about. This is about expanding who is involved. It does not have to be players that put their hand up to do everything. We were having a big discussion yesterday about how we've set this generational change that's happening in Ultimate for those of us that have been around for quite a while. <laughs> for those of you in this room who were born before Sandra, were born when Sandra, uh, Simon started playing, possibly Sandra for that matter. But that there is this change in our sport that we are getting these generational changes now of people who, I haven't, I haven't played at Frisbee tournament for 10 years. 
I've watched what's been going on in Ultimate. I've been the anti-doping officer for seven years, I think. Not that anyone of you would know that. Um, but I haven't played for 10 years, but I am in a position now where I can give back to the sport because I want to. So we're starting to, this group of this base of people we've got in Ultimate to engage with is expanding rapidly. How am I going to time? Board performance and reporting. The board should ensure its officers and directors have appropriate insurance cover. Who has director's insurance cover for their state body? The current insurance you have, the only insurance, the only, I won't say insurance, as is, if you're on a state board or you're on a, a board of an incorporated body, the only insurance protection you have at the moment is that incorporation. If you're not incorporated, you are personally liable for every action of that organisation. If you are not incorporated, someone has an accident, what, they're playing a pickup game that you have organised, they have a, a catastrophic accident. They can sue you as the person. You will lose every asset you have. It's why you get incorporated. Don't ever get involved with a group that's not incorporated. I can't stress that enough. Incorporation gives you legal protection. But more than that now, and particularly at an AFDA level, I mean, some leagues are dealing with turnovers of probably over $100,000. Imagine what the AFDA is dealing with in terms of national teams and the finances involved with taking teams overseas and delivering programs, national events. The turnover is getting really big. And the people making the decisions are liable for that money. So you've got to have the right director's insurance. It can form part of your, um, and it can form part of our national, it probably is part of our national insurance scheme. But after the question, you all got really scared. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's something we have to be aware of and make sure that we apply it properly. That everyone goes pro under, goes the induction process. So when you get onto a board, how do you know what you're supposed to be doing? We've got a loose induction process nationally. Well, not loose, we've got documents that you can read through. You've got to formalise it. Don't just assume it's going to happen. And don't leave it up to one person, because when people change, it gets lost. So have a formal induction process. The Sports Commission want to know that our directors are brought into the sport, or into our organisation, and are support. Do you go to a new job and not get inducted? I'm sure some of you probably turn up on their first day, here's your computer, off you go. It's the same as work. You've got to be inducted properly. Because think of the budget we're dealing with. And the thousands, 7,000 people you are accountable to. So as a director on the AFDA board right now, I'm accountable to 7,000 people. Imagine having a job like that. It's the same thing. I just don't get paid for this one. <laughs> but it is exactly the same that the board needs to regularly review our performance as individual directors. We need to review the performance of the chair and we need to review our committees. Again, coming back to that audit, that reviewing. We need to make sure that we're on the right track. I read a national, another national sport just released that I'm involved with, released their board review this week um, and identified that, you know what, the chair's doing a great job, and she is, but she's not gonna be there for much longer. What is the board doing? How's the performance of the overall board working? And we had some things were identified that weren't working that well. Great, now we know we've gone through a formal process. You have performance reviews at work for managing the jobs and the projects that you do. Then the group managing the AFDA business and the 7,000 members. We should be reviewed as well. Two to go. Are we okay? Getting it dry. Stakeholder relationship and reporting that the board should strive to ascertain the interests and aspira aspirations and requirements of members. That's what we're here to do this weekend as well. Those, like Paul said, those conversations, record them. Talk to the people, make new connections. This is my, my tick box for this weekend, is to get a handle on the enthusiasm of the Australian Ultimate community for what we're looking to do in the next 12 months. That's not gonna be my tick box for the weekend. I have to try and get an understanding of where the community is at in going along this process. I did not say the word journey, I said process. <laughs> but if your board doesn't know what's going on, how are they going to be the leaders? They're actually not leaders to directors of the custodians of this sport. 
that's as a director, as an administrator, you are a custodian of the sport. You don't, you're not bigger than the sport. You are not the sport. You are just there for a short period of time to try and leave in a better place than when you came in. Well, demonstrating leadership as you do that. Um, board should have no voting rights at general meetings. Because the information, the decisions made at general meetings are about the sport. The directors are the ones implementing those decisions. They're the ones forming the rationale. They shouldn't get to vote on it as well because you guys have the power. It's like the chair should have a casting vote. If it's 50-50, how is one person's decision to go either way going to make it in the best interest of the sport? The sport is split 50-50. So you revisit it and you rework the issue. So under the government's principles, the chair will not have a casting vote like they currently do. It's not in the interest of, and it's old school thinking, and that's what we've got the opportunity to move away from. All these other sports who've been funded by the Sports Commission since the late 80s have made all these mistakes and have gone through all these model iterations. We get the benefit of learning from that and not having to deal with the crap that they went through. Last one, ethical and responsible decision making, no brainer. We have a code of conduct for directors and the CEO and staff. So you have coaches, codes of conduct. We have player codes of conduct. What about the administrators? They need codes of conduct. You need to be able to manage their behaviour. They need to be held accountable just like everybody else does. So that is what we are looking to implement. Are there any questions on those? You'll know heaps more when you all sit down and read this tonight before you get to bed. <laughs> all cool? All good? At the moment. Yep. So, how Can we I make a suggestion? Yep. Why doesn't everybody take two Thanks. seconds to talk about how, like we're talking about this on a national level, but these principles apply to organisations at every level all the way down. Most of the people in this room are engaged in the organisation of something, like either a club or a league or whatever it is. Why don't we have a quick chat about what we've seen here and how we could actually use some of these principles at a local level as well, so it filters from the bottom up. Let's have like two minutes to do that. And if you want me to pop any, go back to any of the principles that you just want to revisit.
we want to go through, we want to spend the next 12 months, so this time next year we are voting on a new constitution for the AFDA. So the constitution today is really just to change the financial year. We have to take that to a special general meeting. We also have to do some things to comply with WA legislation, which they've changed over there. But we want to embed these principles in a new constitution, and we want that to be on the table this time next year. So how are we going to do that? Because the other thing we need to address in our constitution is our structure. And we determine our structure by knowing who's going to be, who are the voting members? At the moment, individuals are the voting members. The question and quorum for an AGM or special general meeting at the moment is 20 people. Represents 0.2% of the membership. 0.2% of the AFDA membership can change the entire organisation. Because that's all that's needed. That scares the crap out of me. Most sports have state entities as their voting members or, or in different iterations. It's something to consider. So we need to spend the next 12 months working out what is our structure going to be and applying these principles. And we are going to do that by talking to you. I just like the squiggly lines on here. It makes it look more interesting than what it actually is. But we are, we are looking at what other models are out there. In sport, there's generally two standard structures, a federated structure, a unitary structure. When you read that June 2016 paper, you'll understand the difference. Essentially a federated structure, you have a national body, you have state entities sitting underneath and they all have clubs and regions, whatever their mix up is, and everyone's their own legal entity. A unitary structure, you have a legal entity at a national level and they filter everything down. They make every decision for you. They control everything. Your states have committees who look after delivery at a state level, get to make some decisions, but the national body feeds everything down. And we work in one system. Yep. What are some examples of sports and infrastructure? Unitary. AFL is a unitary model. Seven. AFL is a unitary model. So is triathlon, so is rugby. So some sports are hybrid models as well. Federated structure is your netball, your rugby league, your rugby union. They're all federated models. But um, unitary, taekwondo is a unitary model that mm -hmm. have had all sorts of troubles, but it's worked out better for them. So some sports though have a hybrid. Um, touch football, bless their souls, what a mess. <laughs> they have, Queensland, New South Wales are federated and all the other states are unitary. Bless their souls. But that is the model that works best for them. So we have the opportunity to come up with a model that is gonna work best for us. And there's pros and cons for every type of model. So we are going to look at some other models of work. We are going to come and talk to everybody. So we are going to talk with every state committee. We are going to talk with individuals about what do you want to have a say in with the AFDA? And what's relevant to you? That will help us determine what structure is going to work best for us. Then we're going to pull all the information together. We'll develop a model. We'll come back and talk to you about the model. See if you like it or not. We will work until we get agreement with the membership about the best model for our sport. Then we will morph it into a constitution with all those principles. We'll come back here next year and we'll get those 0.2% of the people in the room and vote on it. <laughs> that's all we have to do. So that's, that's what, when we talk governance and governance reform. Practically, this is what it's going to look like for the next 12 months. Yeah, so great question. Are you going to change um, the minimum number of members required to vote as part of the new constitution? Or Anything's possible. <laughs> Anything's possible. Did One thing will be for sure. Did you mean over this weekend? No, no, as in like when oh, you do the new constitution right. next year. So it's up to the members to decide. We can provide some advice, but it's up to the members to decide. Personally, I think 0.2% is ridiculous when you really look at the stats. But when it was put in there, it was relevant. And it suited the time when it was put in there. <laughs> we want to move away from bribing people with BR to turn up to an AGM. Basically. Well, that is fun. I know it's fun. <laughs> but we could have a hybrid model. We could have a hybrid model. That's right. You want to be there, man. So, the way, and just something food for thought to finish this off, this is my approach to governance. Acknowledge the past, but look to the future. Learn from the past, but don't let it hold us back. So, acknowledge it. We've learned a lot. We've come a long way, but this is where we're going. So, are you excited about governance? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Sandra. Sorry for the
excited about donuts. You're going to be even more excited about I purposely put this picture up because I love mine. <laughs> so, um, all the stuff that Emma has talked around is around governance and getting the structures right so that not only that we can get funding, but it's also about making sure that we actually have an effective organisation. So, so for those of us that have been around for a long time and play ultimate longer than most of you have been alive, um, we've seen ultimate growing from bunches of really passionate people who want to do stuff that we probably expend a lot of energy doing things that we could do more effectively. And getting alignment around the organisation, around the administrators, around the coaches in a way that we do stuff makes us a better organisation. So the stuff that Emma does for sports, I do for corporates. So I help them work out how to be a better organisation, how to be more effective, how to think strategically and actually align themselves so that they can make more money, uh, you know, do better for the community, have more awareness about what they're, what space they're living in, those kinds of things. So, so that's the context that I'm going to talk to you about in terms of having a strategic plan. So, you know, it's great to have a strategic plan so that we can have the right governance and... Sorry? I was just putting a number on it, so oh, okay. it's a draft. Okay. Draft. Because yeah. <laughs> I actually want to consult with you guys as to what we need and what's realistic. Okay? And I'll actually make a comment about it. So I do strategic planning for really, really big guys and strategic plans for five years. Don't worry. They're actually bullshit. So if you try and plan for five years in a changing environment, it's actually really tricky. So, I put in two to three pieces. So, um, yeah, so a strategic plan is not just about getting the governance right and making sure you get money and all those kinds of things, which is great. It's actually around setting the direction so that you guys, when you go back to your state and local associations, or even down to your local team in your club, you have a context by which to work with. You can disagree with it, you can change it, right, within the bounds of the law. But it is a way for you to think about where the AFDA and sports or just sports in Australia is going so that you can choose to align with that or not. Okay, so it's just a way to have a bit of structure around. Um, and, you know, why do we need a strategic plan? We can just keep doing what we do, right? It's all right. Isn't that what you guys do? Yeah, it's cool. Don't need it. To me, I, I'm as passionate about strategic planning as probably, <laughs> maybe a little less, I don't know. Thanks, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think it's a really important foundation. It actually sets where you stand and where you look and where you direct your attention. So those are the things that are really important and I think are useful for, for everybody to, to think about when they're thinking about it. Um, before I go on, I actually just want to give you guys a couple of uh, things to think about. When you're thinking through the session, I'm going to get, I'm going to throw some concepts at you. I'm going to throw some theory and stuff at you. I really want you to think critically about what I'm saying and what you guys are sharing about it. When I say critically, I mean disagree with it. What poke holes in it? I want you to listen and go, oh, Sandra's full of shit. She doesn't know about my context. It really doesn't mean that. What, what's that all about, right? So I really want you to be critical and I'd love to get your feedback on it. And that's part of the process is this shit doesn't work unless you guys can align with it and go, I get that. That's, that's meaningful and useful for what we do, right? Strategic planning for strategic planning's sake is it's a bullshit. Like, I could make a lot of money out of it. <laughs> I, I really could, but it's not useful for an organisation. So getting your feedback and you hearing about it and being critical about it is, is really important. So be, please be critical and also um, think about how it works in your context, right? When I'm talking, you go, how do I apply this? What is, it, what is meaningful in there that I could use and take away at this moment? Very much what Paul was saying, right? Like, what do you want to take? What do you want to do for it? Okay, so strategy 101. So <laughs> it looks really complicated, it's got a lot of colours and you know, you sit in lecture halls and you see the shit in these diagrams and you wonder why. What I wanted to give you guys a context of why strategic planning is really useful 
um, to the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis is you've got to get alignment. You've got to understand the why. So this is the process that I took the ATA board um, through. Uh, we went through it yesterday and we went through it a few months ago, right? To actually start to develop what our strategic direction or intent is going to be. So when you think about doing anything, the first question, first thing that you must think about is why. Why the hell do this? And you've got to think critically about that, right? Um, why did I start playing Ultimate? I've got a ready-made set of friends. Uh, it's active, it's sport. What, why do I do it? Because I, oh, I want to hang out with people who like doing stuff that I like doing. Right. So, you know, the why about it, if you think back down to those intrinsic things that make you want to play Ultimate or be a participant in it, that's where you start. And to do that from an organisational context, you think about what's the vision, what's the mission, what is the mission of the AFTA? And I'll show you guys that in a second, what we got to. We actually developed a, a draft uh, mission statement and a vision statement. And they are two different things, right? So uh, a mission statement is why do you exist? Why does the AFTA exist? What are we good for? Who do we bring value to? And you can ask that of your own organisations and what you do. And the vision, which is different, is if you were to succeed in your mission, what would the world look like? What would the world miss out on if you guys didn't do what you did? Is it important enough and aspirational enough for you to keep going? And if it isn't, maybe some questions to ask about. Okay. So you start with the vision and the mission. And then you actually cascade down to go, OK, I've got the why. What am I going to do? What are my strategic goals or the pillars that are going to help me achieve my mission? And they've got to be aligned, right? So if you've got a goal that doesn't align with your mission or your vision, you're going, why am I doing it? How's it relevant? I, I, I hesitate to ask this question, but I will. How many of you, when you've been involved in Ultimate, ask yourself, why am I doing it? Every day. And you have to somewhere, in your own hearts and minds, reconcile that, right? Because you're all here. <laughs> you're either got cuts for punishment or there is a good reason why you're persistent in this stuff. Right? So you've answered your own why. But now you start to think about well what is it that what is it that's gonna happen or what am I gonna do to achieve that mission? Right? And then you break it down to the next level of detail. And you go, okay, so if these are our strategic goals and these are things that are really important, uh, what are we gonna do and when are we gonna do it? So it's getting down to that next level of detail. We spend a lot of time organisations and ultimate doing right down to this level. How are we going to do it? Who's going to do it? Um, when do we need to get it done? How much is it going to cost? A project-based thinking of the world, which works, right? But if it doesn't line back up to up here, how do you, how do you motivate yourself after a while? How do you understand that you're doing the right work for the right time? So this is why we think about the strategy when we cascade it down. So once we know what the priorities are, what are the actual things that we're going to do? What are we going to spend time and effort on? We're going to have a budget, we're going to start and finish, and we agree to do it. It might not be a budget. The budget just might be your time, right? It might be your commitment to doing a thing. But at least, when you look back and you go, why was I doing this? You can draw a line back to say, this is why I'm doing it. Yeah? And then you can cascade down to projects, and then have KPIs. KPIs, key performance indicators, sound like a businessy way, of, you know, a bit of a wake word. As a consultant, I use that term a lot. Um, but it's about measuring success. How do I know when I'm done? Is, you know, I want to get this school playing frisbee. Does that mean that every child has a frisbee in their hand and they know how to throw a forehand and a backhand and they know how to, to mark? Is that the sign of success? Did I say that I did that? When you do anything, you've got to be able to go, when did I succeed and what is, what is my finishing point? So you've got to be able to measure that, otherwise you're just doing stuff. And I know all of us in this room have just done stuff because it got done, right? But this is just a contextual way to think about how we deal with strategy. And that's the process I took the board through to come up with our, our, our new draft strategic plan. Before I show you that, I'm just going to have a flick through our previous strategic plan, which I'm hoping most of you have even seen before or were involved in. Probably not, actually. <laughs> so, so this was a strategic 
strategic plan from last year and it has a mission of to grow and improve flying disc sports in Australia, which sounds great, but that's not really a mission. It's not sexy. It's not that cool. And the vision is to have 20,000 members by 2020. So remember what it, sorry. How many members do you have? 7,000. It's <laughs> aspirational, <laughs> right? But, you know. So, like to me, that they, these things sound like really good goals to have, and they're not, you know, and they're hard to measure um, if you haven't set the structure around them. So the second one was, you know, we've got lots of partners and resources and programs and national teams and events. So to me, that's not really a strategic plan. That's just giving us a current state. And it shouldn't be in our strategic plan. Like, or these might be goals that we want to grow. Okay? And the last one was our strategies. So, to serve, to be scalable, youth led, teach, give back, and invest. Again, to me, that's not really strategies, they're actually principles. On how, and, and I am being pedantic around the wording because you can, it can be really confusing. And to be honest, strategic plan doesn't have to be complex. But it just doesn't quite feel like it fits. I, I know that it was fit for purpose at the time. Uh, it helped us get in front of you know, government agencies and um, have a conversation about Ultimate. But I think we need to take that <coughs> and take a step back and think about what I was showing you around before around Strategy 101, right? Just give us a little bit more structure around what we're trying to do and understand the foundation before we go jumping off on projects. Yeah. So that's our current mission and vision. To show you that again. Now what I'm going to put up next is a draft mission statement that um, after quite a few conversations with the AFD board and a few others yesterday, so we had a few uh, people from the state association that attended the session. This is the draft mission that we came up with. I'll let you read it for a second. So I'm going to say it aloud because you think about it a little differently. Promote and provide access to disc sports in Australia by providing player opportunities from the local park to the podium and building leadership and community through the spirit of the game. So my first test for a good mission is, does it feel right? <coughs> does that explain why you're involved in Ultimate? What do you think? I'll take, ta so Tara said to me, oh, it's a bit wordy. <laughs> <laughs> you get rid of the word local, because then you can add part of the podium, which is, has better alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, see? So, so part of the podium, that sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh, yeah. So, um, we, we got to go through some iterations, and actually we need to be getting your feedback on this stuff, right? So I'll preempt the next steps. The idea is that we get feedback from you guys around this. And we will land on something, but, this was a gut response to why does the AFD exist? Oh, I like it. It feels right. And I don't have a smirk saying it, you know. It, it feels like that's what we should aspire to. You know, this is the future of ultimate. Yeah. And building leadership and community yeah. to the spirit of the game, that is what we're about. I love that. Too. It feels yeah. really nice, right? No, it's like, about the first nine words. Yeah. 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 I love the end of it, but I think yeah. you can just provide player opportunities from park to podium and building leadership and community through spirit of the game. Let's hear that. Let's go. Are you getting that sign? But I'm just going to play the wrong man. Tara's so, right. Tara. Yeah, that's right. Tara's right. Yeah. So, yeah, so this was our first kind of like trying to encapsulate everything that Ultimate and Disc Sports and things are about the AGA, and that's the original one we came up with. Okay, sorry, can I ask a slightly unrelated question? Yes. We're using the word AFPA. Is Ultimate Australia not a thing anymore? So, no, 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 it is. So, formally, legally, I think we're called the AFPA. Mm -hmm. So, part of the conversation we want to have, and it's a great point you asked, so part of the conversation we want to have about um, the AFPA and the Constitution and all those kinds of things is are we being too exclusive mm -hmm. by just being Ultimate? Should we be the sport that people go to where it, a, a piece of plastic is involved. Mm. We may not have to run all of it, but when you reduce the different layers of organisation, if we're internally fighting with Australian disc golf, we're not, but you know, mm. if we were completely separate organisations, to an outsider, it's like, it's, it's, it's just right. It's all the same, isn't it? So 
So if we can be internally coherent about all the sports, it's an end of the story. And that's just the public, like that's not land, we haven't landed on that, but the public government's process and the strategic planning process is to try and get that sense that it's not just ultimate players. Like I'm, I'm guessing that we're almost 100% ultimate frisbee players here. And where you started was probably ultimate frisbee, except I don't know. <laughs> Um, so we definitely have a bias toward that, but we shouldn't exclude other, other dis sports. I, I feel like it's a bit disrespectful to other or, sports. Or is it like diluting your brand? Is it easier to like sell one strong product than have kind of multiple things that come with the It's a possibility, but I, I look at cricket. 2020, one day in that internationals, big bash, uh, you know, tests, all of those things. But that's the difference between beach and grass. To me, disc golf is a totally alien sport. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, imagine you go to soccer ball and play golf. Yeah. 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 Is that soccer? Ball? <laughs> and I'm jumping. I think football. Soccer yeah, yeah. has a partnership with foot golf, though. That kind of yeah. thing. So, so futsal, yeah. um, <laughs> indoor, outdoor, walking <laughs> soccer, beer soccer. They're all real. So it's a conversation we have. So, it, you know. I guess our initial thought was make it disc sport so that it's inclusive enough. We don't have to do it. Like, you know, we, we know that disc golf plays are there. Anyway, so I do want feedback on this, so we're not going to work through it now, but um, I'm just showing this to you guys so that we've been through a few conversations and we want to get the feedback on it. So this is where we got to with the draft vision statement. So our vision statement is, if you were to achieve your mission, what would the world look like? Disc sports is part of everyday life. How cool would that be? At home, everyone has a football and a frisbee at home. Then the second one was one we had you know, interesting discussions on, creating ethical and inspirational communities and leaders. If you think about Frisbee, we're different. <laughs> In a good way. We're special. Like when we talked about the language that ultimate Frisbee players and other disc sports players have, we are highly collaborative. We are really flexible. Um, you know, we, everyone has the right to say something. So, you know, you, your voice is heard. The whole thing about spirit of the game is self refereeing, right? It creates an environment where you have to speak for yourself and stand up for what you understand to be the truth, right? That's not something that occurs in other sports. Look at soccer. Diving is, in, you know, it's part of the sport because you want to play the ref. When everyone is the ref on the field, it's, that opportunity is not there. Okay, so that, that concept, I think we undersell that concept. And, you know, to take a side note, I think we undersell... Um, Frisbee. We're always the poor cousin. Can you come and play? Okay, can you come? I'll, I'll even pick you up. Come on. <laughs> right? Rather than, we are the sport. You should just come along because we're awesome. <laughs> right? And, and I think when we talk to other sporting <coughs> bodies, we've got to have that attitude to go, we are the sport to be. You just don't know it yet. Right? You know, I had a discussion with JDR about low cost. I hate that term, and that's meant that's my personal opinion. Because low cost means cheap. Means, you know, uh, $2 bargain bin. We want to be great value. That's the story, that's so much better to hear than, we're a bit cheap, come along, because we're not really, really, really desperately need you. It's a different story and a different mindset. It sounds really small, but it's a really big thing in your own minds and what to carry out. All right, so after we went through the process of, of articulating what we thought was our draft vision and mission, we actually went through and, and, and thought about what are the key strategic pillars or our strategic goals that the AFTA should be pursuing, and is already pursuing, but we need to articulate in a way that you guys and everyone can go, we know what it is. So Emma kindly came up with the three Ps. It is about one. Yeah, Tara, maybe. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, participation. We want to get as many people playing frisbee as we can. 
performance. Right? We want to get to the podium. Wherever that podium may be, whether it's a local club or on the world stage, right? And profile. And I don't know if any of you noticed the picture. Of <laughs> some, some people don't know who that is. It's my husband. <laughs> Most people won't fall. <laughs> Most people won't fall. Um, getting an award from Natalie Cook. Thankfully, I know she is. Thank you. 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 Thank giving Matt a volunteer award. <coughs> so that's raising the profile of us, right? So those are the three pillars that we came up with to think about our, our goals and our, where, what we want to focus on for the ATA and looking into the future, right? So again, I want feedback on that. So I'll be sending this out to all of you and to the broader community to get your thoughts on how that works. So I just, just cut, oh, I am over time. All right, I will move that. So participation, right? So more people playing to sports. We've got a few uh, strategic priorities that we want to look at. How do we measure uh, what we've got? So we don't even know what our player base looks like. How do, we, how do we do something if we don't know what that actually looks like? How are they getting into the sport? We've got to get some data on that, right? And that actually helps us inform then how do we build our participation framework. Right? So structuring itself, it's not just you know, the local people doing their own thing. Can still be, but at least you've got a national context. How do we develop resources to support that? And then actually how do we design programs to support okay, So those are our draft strategic priorities, um, and we will be evolving those. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go through this quickly because I know we're running out of time. Next one is halfway to the podium, right? So the strategic priorities that we want to do is we want to make it easier for players and coaches and administrators. So the, there's actually a development pathway that you can recognise and you can do something with, right? Having a high performance committee with terms of reference. Yeah. Structure. Yeah. And then having an appropriate budget and funding for it, right? Rather than piecemeal, we can think about it in the context of everything that we do so that we actually structure it correctly and give it the things that it needs. Um, developing good partnerships, Australia wide and internationally, with other sports. With universities, institutions, the AIS, whoever that might be, to actually give us a step up. Because we're a young sport, we don't have that infrastructure, so why don't we work with others that do? And then bidding for international events, bringing those events to Australia so that for those of us who don't travel as much, we can see world class on our doorstep and we can see what that looks like. And we're doing a lot of that, right? So, uh, you know, Masters in 2020, uh, bidding for worlds. Uh, 2022. 2022, right? So trying to bring the world to us. And the last one is profile, right? Having the ATA and the sports as recognisable brands. It doesn't say that we're the biggest brand because we're competing with lots of other traditional sports, but at least make us more recognisable. Like the fact that we have a pro league in the US and Australia, most Australians still don't know what ultimate frisbee is. Why aren't we maximising that? We actually need to structure that. So we need to clarify our role as the ATA and then the state associations and how you play that role. We need to actually have consistent branding. We've got to have the right story, the same story. Because I bet you we all have a different way of explaining what we do, right? Getting some internal consistency is really helpful. And then we clarify our products. What are we selling? What do we do and what don't we do? Does everyone know that? Right? Do you have an inter internally consistent idea in your own head about what you're selling, and then delivering on the market plan, marketing plan. So actually having a structure and a plan to do all this stuff, okay? So uh, the next step for us was then to assign, so Dan is gonna look after developing the strategic initiatives and the priorities around participation and performance, and Sarah is gonna look at the marketing and profile side, and we will share that with you guys, right? So as we evolve those, the idea is to get your room for it and for you to take some of that away and actually use it as well for your own projects. Okay? Just an important thing I wanted to highlight is we want it to be enabled by key principles and foundations, right? And the very first one is governance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to have 
good structure and process to support all of the stuff, or it just kind of keeps bubbling along. We kind of it could be somewhat successful. It doesn't have to. It's not as strong, and we have an opportunity to do that, right? If we can turn around an organisation in 12 months and make us have a good solid base, everything else gets easier. And a few of these other principles that we talked about but hadn't quite articulated in the board is we want to be consistent and transparent. We want to share the story with you as, as playing members and administrators and as coaches, right? Using collaboration. We've got a lot of smart people that play this sport. I, I, I would actually love to see how many degrees we have in Oxford. The number of people we've got in <coughs> Probably more than 7,000, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember going to a Worlds a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and I think it was in Germany. And I was in the bus with the Australian men's team. And we had six doctors, three vets, and then several other PhDs as well. So of, of a team of 19 or 20 guys, 16 of them had a ridiculous amount of qualification. So, got really bloody smart people. Um, the next one's sustainability, right? It's future-proofing this organisation, so it is not just dependent on us. It survives over time, and it can handle us not being part of it. I know that's hard to imagine, but if you were plucked out of what you were doing now, does everything stop? Maybe. It's pretty risky, isn't it? So if you can actually have processes in place that are independent of your own ability to deliver it and someone else with equal capability could, that would be great. And then having the right leadership and culture. This stuff sinks or helps us rise to the top. And we have a really, really amazing culture in Ultimate that we should use. So that's another founding principle that we need to follow. All right, last slide. Okay, so the idea is the next steps we have, we want to develop the next iteration of the strategic initiative, so get a little more detail in there, and then we want to evolve the, the, the mission and vision statements, right? So we, we lock it down and we've got something that we can work to as a base. And the next one, it's one word, feedback. We want to get it out in the community and getting you guys to tell us what you think about it. Whether it's shit, whether the word's wrong, does it sound right, does it apply to you, we want your feedback. And then we actually want to release the final strategic plan for this period. And it might actually be like 2019, 21, 23, I don't know. Um, so the idea is that we get your feedback and then we do something with it. And then you've got a strategic plan which you can take back and apply or ignore. <coughs> Up to you. All right? So um, that's me. So I'm well over time. I apologise, but I really wanted you guys to, to get your heads around that. There's a lot of it, a lot of stuff, but again, um, Please think critically about this stuff. I want you to be back. Is there a time frame on this? The next few months? Okay, that's great. That's so we will have the next iteration probably in the next couple of weeks. So I just didn't want to pin it on these guys to do it. But uh, yeah, please enjoy the conference and do think about everything that is going on and how it might apply to you guys. So enjoy the rest of the next couple of days.